Well, good morning, everyone. Um, this is an unusual situation. Many of you, or most of you, are going to be watching this from your homes. And if that's strange for, for you, it's even stranger for me to be standing here in front of a camera in a half-empty sanctuary. Um, but we are going to do our best and to work our way and continue in the series in Romans that uh, Matthew's been preaching through. So last week, uh, Matthew talked about Romans 6. And one of the major points that he was making is that uh, as a Christian, if you've given your life to Christ, you live in a new reality. And, and Matthew had the, the, the rings that, that he had. He had a little man that was stuck in the ring that said, you know, before Christ, you're stuck in sin. And all you do is make circles in the sin. Um, so that reality was we're stuck there partly because we don't have the ability to get out of it. And, uh, and partly because when you don't have God in your life, you're really not concerned if you're sinning or not anyways. And so that's something you're not really worried about. But then he also said the new reality is Christ breaks you out of that sin and puts you into a new loop where you are now um, in Christ instead of in sin. <clears throat> and as we give our lives to him, we have our identity in him. And so if our identity is in him, if he dies to sin, we die to sin. So we have this new reality that we are dead to sin. And so now we have a, a choice. We can decide how we are going to live to overcome sin and avoid sin. So Paul has made this case up to this point, and now in chapter 7, he's going to make two more points to kind of add on to this. And, uh, and one, the more important point that we're going to talk about today is the idea that overcoming sin, just because Christ died to take away the sin, that doesn't mean that overcoming sin is easy. In fact, overcoming sin can be very difficult, but God has provided a solution. The other thing Paul talks about before that is he addresses um, the relationship between what he's been talking about and the law. And for his audience here in the, in the book of Romans, when he was writing to the church at Rome, which was half Jews and half Gentiles, especially the Jewish half could have had some real questions about how does this relate to the law? And in the last couple of chapters, he's been talking about the law versus grace and that we're not under the law, we're under grace. And, and it would be kind of easy for them to get the idea that law is bad and grace is good, and, in, and that they're in their total opposition. And that's not the case, and so Paul is going to take some time to explain this. And so we're going to look at that, and actually we're going to look at that fairly briefly, because I think the meatier part of what we want to talk about is the second half, where he addresses this idea of overcoming sin and how difficult that can be. So at the beginning of, verse, of chapter 7, Paul uses this analogy um, that probably would have been quite good for the people of that time, but might be a little tougher for us to understand. And it's almost like we're coming in on the middle of this conversation because there's so much Jewish context going on here. And I don't know if you've ever been in the situation where someone starts explaining something and they're taking a long time to get to the point and you're waiting for them to get to the point and by the time they finally get to the point you forgot what they were talking about in the first place. And, and there's a risk of doing that with this passage. Paul builds up and builds up and builds up to make his point. So what we're gonna do is we're actually gonna read this passage backwards. All right, well, we're going to take it in chunks backwards. I'm not good at reading backwards, backwards. Um, but we're going to look at um, a little bit, and we're going to take it in three parts, and we're going to start with his point and then work back up to the analogy that he uses. And like I said, we're going to go through this fairly quickly. There's a lot here. Um, we're not going to cover it verse by verse. I'm going to give you the gist and kind of net out what Paul is saying so we can get to the second half of this. So if you look in chapter 7, we're going to jump down and start actually in verse 7. And so Paul says this, What shall we say then? Is the law sin? May it never be. On the contrary, I would not have come to know sin except through the law, for I would not have known about coveting if the law had not said, You shall not covet. But sin, taking opportunity through the commandment, produced in me coveting of every kind. For apart from the law, sin is dead. I was once alive apart from the law. When the commandment came, sin became alive and I died. And this commandment, which was to result in life, produced, pr proved to result in death for me. For sin, taking an opportunity through the commandment, deceived me and, though, and through it killed me. So then the law is holy and the commandment is holy and righteous and good. Therefore, did that which is good become a cause of death for me? May it never be. Rather, it was sin in order that it might be shown to be sin by affecting my death through that which is good, so that through the commandment, sin would become utterly sinful. Okay, that's really a brainful, isn't it? Um, that's a lot to kind of take in and to think about and to understand. 
But I'm going to kind of, again, net out what Paul is saying. He's starting out saying, okay, is the law sin? We've been talking about the, being under law and under grace, and the law is this. And, and he says, is the law sin? And, this is the, and he gives the same response that he gave last week to a couple of the questions that Matthew asked, um, that, that he said he asked in chapter 6. Uh, in chapter 6, he said, since we're under grace and under the law, should we just go ahead and sin? Or should we sin as much as possible so that great, God's grace is even more than, than we can imagine? And he had the same response, may it never be, or no way, or forget it. The Greek is kind of fun. In the Greek, it's meganoito. And so Paul says, meganoito, no, no way. It is not that, the, that um, the law is sin. The fact and what the point he's making in here is that the law reveals sin. The law shows what is sinful. It tells you what is right and what is wrong. So, and he's saying, look, ignorance is bliss. When I didn't know what was right and wrong, I didn't worry about it. I was fine. I could do all of these things. But then when I found out what was right and wrong, now things have changed. Now I'm responsible for my actions. Now I have to, to decide what is right and what is wrong. And I have to live that way. And so <clears throat> those, th those things that we did before, suddenly we re realize that, you know what, we can't do those things anymore. We, we, we can't do those because we're in a different situation when we're in Christ. The other point he makes is that the law provokes temptation. So the law reveals the sin, but it also provokes temptation in that in our fallen state, the minute we're told not to do something, what do we want to do? We want to do it, right? Everyone has, that has kids knows this is the case. Don't do this, and the first thing they want to do is do it. In our fallen state, as soon as we're told not to, we want to do it. And that's the point Paul is making here. As soon as I found out I wasn't supposed to do it, now I want to do it even more. And so the great irony that Paul is, is stating here with when it comes to the law is that the law should protect us from sin, but it actually in reality the law elicits and brings out sin. And so this is one of the reasons that the law is imperfect. And we see that the law, he says, leads to death. Is that the law can never bring life. The law can only show you what's wrong. It's not that the problem was with the law. The problem is with us who can't follow the law. So in the end... He says in verses 12 and 13, the law is holy and good. It shows what is right. So don't blame the law for the sin. It's just pointing out the truth. We have to blame ourselves for the sin. Fortunately, we died to sin through Christ, which in turn freed us from the power of the law. And so backing up, we're going to take the next section going back, which is verses 5 and 6. And Paul says, For while we were in the flesh, the sinful passions which were aroused by the law, that's what we just talked about, we're at work in the members of our body to bear fruit for death. But now we have been released from the law, having died to that by which we were bound. So we serve in the newness of the spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. So while in the flesh we wanted to do what was wrong, but we have been released in the spirit. And one of the keys that he talks about here is at the very end when he says, we, are, we walk in the newness of the spirit, not the oldness of the letter. And we're going to talk about that as we get into the next section, about this idea of living in the newness of the spirit and not the oldness of the letter. So how is this able to happen? Now we're going to back up to the analogy, which is in verses 1 to 4, where, where Paul kind of makes his case starting out that, that this is going to be possible um, because the law has been fulfilled and the law no longer has rule over us. So starting in verse 1, finally, back to the beginning. Or do you not know, brethren... For I am speaking to those who know the law. Again, this is to help out those people um, who are Jewish and may have been confused by this. Do you not know that the law has jurisdiction over a person as long as he lives? For the married woman is bound by law to her husband while he was living. But if the husband dies, she is released from the law concerning the husband. So then, if while the husband is living, she is joined to another man, she shall be called an adulteress. But if the husband dies, she is free from the law. So she is not an adulteress, though she is joined to another man. Therefore, my brethren, you also were made to die to the law through the body of Christ so that you might be joined to another, to him who raised you from the dead, in order that we may be, bear fruit for God. So Paul uses this analogy of marriage that says before Christ, they had the law. There was nothing else. They were bound to that law, just like you were bound to your first marriage. But the death of Christ meant the death of the power of the law. And since he died to the law... Therefore, we die to the law in Christ, and the law no longer is that thing which we are trying to be beholden to. We are in the newness of the spirit, not in the oldness of the letter. 
So in this first half, just to kind of recap this first issue, this concern with the law, the law does lead to death in that it results in temptation, it reveals a standard unattainable by human effort, and the law cannot remove or set you free. It cannot remove sin. The law doesn't remove it, it just points it out. But through Christ's death, he conquered death that comes from trying to keep the law. And so we know that the law still is holy and good. It reveals God's holiness and points out what is sinful. So he's answered that question for them, but now he's going to dive into this second issue, which is that we may um, be free from the law and we might have this newness in Christ, but overcoming sin still isn't easy and it just doesn't happen automatically. So in verses uh, 14 to 24, these we are going to go through a little slower, kind of piece by piece. And I want to introduce three characters, so to speak, or three things Paul is going to talk about as he goes through this section. So the first thing he's going to talk about is the law, which we just talked about, right? The law, that thing which points out sin, that thing which is holy and good. So he's going to, one of the characters is the law. The next character is sin or flesh. He kind of uses those terms together. So the sin is our desires that run contrary to God's will. And the flesh is our nature that wants to rebel and do its own thing. So both of those things is our tendency to want to not do what God wants us to do. It's our tendency in our fallen state to sin, to do the wrong thing. But he's kind of giving these um, almost an embodiment that sin does this or that flesh does this. So he's making the, these kind of characters that are in tension. And the last character, the first one was the law, the second one was sin and flesh kind of together. He'll use both terms. The third one was I, Paul talking about himself. And he interjects his experience in here as the person who's trying to make a choice between what is right and wrong. And some, there's been debate among people whether or not Paul is speaking as one who is an unbeliever who needs the Spirit to help him, or as a believer who is struggling with sin. And I say he's speaking from all of humanity. It's both. It's both and. Because before Christ you struggle with sin, and even after Christ you struggle with sin. But the, either way, the answer is still the same. The answer is Christ, right? And so we're going to come to that conclusion. And so Paul talks about himself. So we're going to go through this and talk about this battle, which is very real for every Christian. If you've been a believer for at all, you will be able to relate to what Paul says about the struggle we're here. But I also want to uh, make the point that as we're going through this, remember that Paul in this is pointing out the problem. There is a solution, and he's going to get to the solution. So this problem isn't a place we're stuck. He's just describing this so that he can make sure that we all understand what we're struggling with. So, diving in, Romans uh, 7, starting in verse 14, <clears throat> he says, For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am of flesh, sold under sin. So right away he makes this contrast, right? The contrast that the law is showing what is right, it is spiritual, but in my flesh I'm going to rebel. It's, I'm in the flesh, I'm, 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 I'm liable to sin. Verse 15, I do not understand my own actions, for I do not do what I want, but the very thing I hate, I do. Now, if I, do not, if I do what I do not want, I agree with the law that it is good. So he knows what is right and wrong. He's agreeing with the law that it's good. But he also knows that what he's doing is bad. In fact, the fact that we don't want to do these things and it bothers us just reveals the fact that the law is good. The law was right all along. It was showing us that we really don't want to do this. And that's why we're being bothered by it. So continuing on, he says, so in verse 17, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. For I know that nothing good dwells in me, that is, in my flesh. For I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. For I do not do the good that I want, but the evil that I do not is what I keep on doing. Now if I do what I do not want, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. So the point he's making here is in our sin slash flesh, in this evil nature, <clears throat> our fallen humanness will continue to want to do what's wrong. Our, call, our fallen humanness always will continue to want to do what's wrong. And until we come to be with the Lord, we will still be in this body of flesh that there's a part of us that will always rebel against the spirit that we have that's going to want to do wrong. And what's worse, Paul says, there's nothing there to help us apart from Christ. We know that, but at this point he hasn't introduced Christ yet. He's saying we're helpless here. We, we can't do anything about this. 
So in verse 21, he says, So I find it to be a law that when I want to do right, evil lies close at hand. For I delight in the law of God in my inner being, but I see in my members another law, waging war against the law of my mind and making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. So herein lies the battle. Here it is. We know what's right. We know what God's law is, but we struggle to do it. Our flesh, our old nature, wants to rise up and exhibit itself and take over and do what it wants to do. It's a battle. In fact, Paul even says they are waging war. Folks, spiritual warfare, fighting sin is a war. We kind of think that as soon as we come into Christ that all our sin should just go away. No, what, sin is, what, what Christ has done is given us the proper weapons to wage the war so we can win. Without him, we have no hope. We have no choice. We are totally in sin. But with him, he gives us a way to, to, for victory. And that's why Paul laments in 24, Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Here we are, we're stuck on our own without Christ. You can probably guess who he's going to say is going to deliver us from this body of death, right? Here it comes, right? Thanks be to God, through Jesus Christ our Lord. So here's the solution. There is a battle but Paul now is going to turn the corner and start talking about the solution that we have to this. Thanks be to God through the Lord, through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then I myself serve the law, serve the law of God with my mind, but with my flesh I serve the law of sin. So Jesus will deliver us. We have to allow the, God, the law of God that we know to control our bodies and thoughts so we don't know sin. So he's given us this idea, still the, the, the battle is there, we're going to serve God with our mind, with our flesh. We might try and serve sin, but Jesus Christ is going to overcome both. So even though this was a sermon on chapter 7, we can't just stop there. Because the good stuff is at the beginning of chapter 8. So we're going to look at the first, we're going to kind of sneak into the first few verses of chapter 8 here and see the solution a little more borne out. And then next week when we actually preach on chapter 8, I'm going to start and recover this a little bit and then fill out the rest of chapter 8. Romans 8.1, famous verse, Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. How much condemnation? None. Think about that. There is no condemnation. If you are in Christ, there is nothing you can be condemned of. That should be a freeing thought, folks, that there is no condemnation, no judgment against us at all. Why? In verse 2, For the law of the Spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. We are free from that battle of the law of sin and death. We have victory over sin. This is what we need, this huge battle that we've had. We need victory over it. And we need freedom from it. And Jesus Christ has brought that victory through the law of the Spirit. He continues in verse 3, for what God has done, um, for God, sorry, excuse me, for God has done what the law, weakened by flesh, could not do. This is what we said before, the law can't save anybody. But sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law may be fulfilled in us. So Paul says he condemns sin in the flesh. Remember, there's, there's, there's two things, right? How much condemnation do we have? None, right? What is condemned? It's the sin. He has condemned the sin in the flesh. All that condemnation goes to that. The requirement of the law is filled, fulfilled. So the idea that our salvation and over, ability to overcome sin on its own and on our own is null and void. This is really what, uh, what Matthew's been preaching through in all of these first chapters of, of Romans, right? Is that we can't do this on our own. And no matter how good we think we are and how well we've been trying to act and, and how fine we feel and everything else, there is nothing that is good enough. And he's making the point again here. All of these efforts are null and void because they aren't needed. They are no longer requirement. This requirement of the law was fulfilled in Christ. He has set us free from having to do those things to fulfill the law. He gives us our salvation, but he also gives us the ability to overcome sin and become free. Now, there's probably some of us who don't feel very free. 
Some of us may feel very much like we are quite continually defeated by sin and that sin rules over our lives, even as believers. So how do we live in this freedom that Paul describes that we can have? The key is in this next line of verse 4. Reading verse 4 from the beginning. In order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us, here's the point, us who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. And this, folks, is the great choice that we have. This is a choice we didn't have before Christ. Before Christ, we only had one thing we could do, and that was to walk in the flesh and be stuck in that circle and just do the same things. Now we have the spirit of Christ in us. And the choice is, are we going to walk in the spirit or are we going to walk in the flesh? So we can walk in the flesh like we used to and maybe continue to do, or we can walk in the spirit. And walking in the spirit is walking in the newness of the spirit, not the oldness of the letter. That's what Paul said previously, right? It's this newness that we have. Last week, uh, Matthew put up this quote from John Piper, and I think it is just as appropriate this Sunday as it was last Sunday. The quote was this, We can be legally free and still choose to live like a prisoner. Paul has a simple command and encouragement for the Christian, be what you are. We can walk in the Spirit. You can choose to still be a prisoner. You can choose to still walk in the flesh. It's not going to just automatically happen that sin is overcome. But if you're willing to walk in the Spirit, then that ability is there to be free. We can walk like we are free. Last week, also, uh, Paul alluded to this idea of being a slave. And Matthew commented on that. Nobody likes the idea of, of being a slave to anything. We like to think how free we are, right? But he, he said in, in chapter 6, you can be a slave to sin or you can be a slave to righteousness. And, you know, like it or not, we are all slaves to something. Because even if you say I'm totally free and, oh, nothing has control over me and, and I just do my whatever I want, you can say that all you want. But here's the thing. Even in the midst of that, you have your own worldview. You have your own belief system. And you are choosing to live under that belief system. And as soon as you choose to live under something, what are you? You're a slave to it, aren't you? So you are going to be a slave to your own world system or somebody else's world system or God's world system. You're going to be a slave to something because you choose actually to be a slave of whatever it is. You pick your master, basically. And so the question is, Paul is saying here, which master do you want to choose? You can choose the right master, or you can just keep following that old master you used to have, but you don't have to follow that master. We have the newness of the spirit where we have been set free. So you can submit to being a slave to the oldness, or you can submit to being a slave of the God who created the universe the God who went to extreme measures to bring us back to him, the God who wants to bless you with amazing blessings, you can choose that master. That's a good master. Or you can choose being a slave of some other worldview that in the end is based on the law in one form or another, and we know that the law leads to death. So if you want to follow that worldview, even as a Christian, nothing is stopping you. You choose who you serve. But I would submit that God is the best master to choose. And choosing him as a master and choosing to submit to God really in the end is a joy. It's not always easy. Sometimes it's incredibly, incredibly hard. But it is still a joy. The reason it's hard is because the battle is real. Our old flesh inside of us still wants to well up and have its own way. And we have to say, no flesh, I'm choosing the spirit. I have the spirit in me and I'm going to do what the spirit says, not what you say. And every day it is a choice. But it's a winnable war because Christ is victory over sin. And he is the victor. So the battle is real. You know, when you come to Christ, it's not all of a sudden like lollipops and sunshine, right? And everything is beautiful. For for some of us, it was like that for maybe six months or so as we go through this great, you know, rush of becoming a new Christian. And then reality hits as the fact that, wow, I'm still struggling with stuff. Wow, these things are still coming back. Wow, what is going on here? 
And then we feel like maybe we're not the, maybe we didn't give our lives to God, or maybe we're, I'm not a really a Christian, or oh, woe is me. And then Satan starts hammering us with how bad we are. And the point is that we have to understand, we have to come in with our eyes wide open, that when you become a Christian, you are entering the war, not getting out of the war. And <clears throat> we're going to be warring against the flesh, and we're going to be warring against principalities and powers and evil in the world, right? And so we have to be willing to walk in the Spirit. And so this is the great turning point, really, I think, in the book of Romans, where Paul, for these first six chapters, was building this case that we just can't do anything without God. We are so hopeless and so helpless, and he gives case after case and example after example of why we can't do this, we can't do this. And now he's going to turn the whole book and start saying, okay, guys, yeah, on your own you can't do it, but in the Spirit. Oh, in the Spirit. Now we've changed some things. Now we have some newness here. We do have the Spirit. And we should be walking in the Spirit. Um, I want to also quote, Paul makes this point, you know, here in Romans he makes this idea of walking in the Spirit. Also in Galatians, Galatians 5, verses 16 to 18, very, very common passage, right? Paul says, but I say, walk in the Spirit, and you will not carry out the desire of the flesh. Here he is, he's laying out the same argument in another book. It's not a one-shot theme for, for Paul, this idea of walking in the Spirit. Verse 17, for the flesh sets its desire against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. For these are in opposition to one another, so you may not do the things you please. But if you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. You know, really, Paul just said in about two sentences what he just <laughs> took a, a chapter and a half to say. But he summed it all up there. This battle is real, but walk in the spirit. And so what, next week, this is kind of, a, this is a half of a sermon, and so now you're all ready to find out how this works. No, you have to pause, and you can hit the pause on your, on your uh, YouTube or whatever you're watching this on or whatever. And if you don't hit pause, it doesn't matter because this is going to end because I'm going to be done in a second here. But Paul says some exciting things coming up in chapter 8 about walking in the Spirit. But in the meantime, for this week, I want us to be encouraged. I want us to be encouraged by this idea that we are not under the law, folks. We are free. We are free to walk in the Spirit. And, 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 and in terms of this, Paul is really underlining the battle, right, against sin and how we can overcome sin. But walking in the Spirit also means we can be a great blessing to others. And obviously, we're in a time where the need for people to bless each other is extremely, extremely important. So we should look at this as just a great wow to say, you know what? God has provided us as believers the great privilege of his spirit that not only do we not have to be in bondage to sin at times like this, we can overcome the sin, but we can even be in a place to bless others. And so that is my hope and prayer, and I'm, I'm sure it is for, for our whole church, that in this time we would be encouraged that God has given us his spirit and that through his spirit, we will be able to bless others and overcome sin. Let's pray. Father, I ask that you would help this church to be fully alive, that the death of sin would not have any kind of lure, and that the glory of your spirit would be so amazing that we would just want to turn our, our backs on our own flesh and our own old desires, and that we would rush to you, to love you, to serve you, and to bless others. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.